And it looks like we're live. Um, hello and welcome to this panel on community building for equity and inclusion. We're really excited to dive deep on some of these topics of how we really bring together communities and get diverse input at the outset to create better outcomes for technology. Um, this is a very relevant panel, I think, for today. And it, it seems like an obvious conversation at this stage that blockchain technology is at right now. So I'm Samita Deshmukh to introduce myself. As they said, I'm at the World Economic Forum and I work on our blockchain and digital assets team. And I'm excited to have a great panel here today. Um, so it sounds like we're experiencing a few technical difficulties. My co-panelists can't hear me, so they're shaking their heads. Hopefully we can get that up and running in a moment. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists in the meantime, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll make sure that we get those to our panelists. Sheila, Maurice, and Marnie, if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Okay, we're live. Yay. Okay. Um, so you know what the panel is about, so I don't need to introduce it to you, uh, which is what I was doing to the audience. But I'd love to have you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do and what brings you to this conversation today. So I'll start off with you, Sheila. Great. Thanks, Samita. I'm Sheila Warren. I am the head of blockchain data policy and digital assets at the World Economic Forum. And uh, I am very interested and passionate about uh, inclusion in technology, and particularly in blockchain technology, which I think presents a unique opportunity for us as a blockchain ecosystem to think differently uh, about how we build in this space and to really realize the principles of decentralization, not just as an abstract philosophy, but as something that really can prove a method of empowerment for uh, citizens all over the world. Great. Over to you, Marnie. I'm Marnie Webb. I uh, work for TechSoup. We're a large nonprofit organization that helps civil society groups all around the world. And I've been lucky enough to work with a team of people there that have built out a design process that's built on participatory action research. Um, and we hope starts to um, be open enough to be able to be more inclusive um, and we're always trying to Im improve that process, uh, often painfully. And we're going to dive into that a little bit more later in the panel. And Maurice. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maurice Wilkins. I lead diversity and inclusion at a San Francisco tech company called Fastly. Um, outside of my full-time role, I am an organizer for a new initiative called Black Tech for Black Lives, um, which is thinking about the responsibility of folks like myself who work in tech spaces, who operate and carry a lot of power and privilege and also, also know what to do and how to channel that. Um, so using the, the privilege that we have to begin thinking about what is our responsibility to support the folks who are on the front lines of movements, the folks who are actively risking their bodies and their, their livelihood to ensure that we have a better society um, what is our role in that? How do we enable them? How do we support su support that work? So yeah, that's what I spend my time on. Great, and I'm I'm excited to dive into that and see what lessons we can learn and what we can do in the blockchain community as well. Um, so I'd like to start off with Sheila. Actually, can you frame up this conversation for us? So where does community community building show up? in blockchain technology in both the development and deployment? And what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing today? Well, I, I'll start off a bit pessimistically. I, I would say, in my opinion, sadly, uh, it doesn't show up uh, remotely as often as it ought to. Uh, and I think that what we have done and are continuing to do and will continue to do unless we engage in course correction is really mimic processes that have come before us in technology. Uh, the idea to move really quickly, to uh, you know, to, to really quickly deploy a POC to get something out there to beta, and while all those things have very understandable systemic reasons behind them, the need to kind of show to funders, you know, that you're doing something, that you have a product that's viable to secure subsequent rounds of funding, things like that. There are some realities here, but what I worry about is, especially with this technology, 
we have an opportunity to really think about systems design. So what I often say is that, you know, in my, in my mind, one of the a sad outcome uh, would be that we take exactly the systems that exist today and digitize them. And to some extent, that's what a lot of technology has done. It's taken existing systems and made them faster and more efficient. And these are not bad goals. They're not bad things. But they haven't really changed the power dynamics inherent in those systems. They haven't really addressed the biases within those systems. And particularly because we have such a lack of diversity in the build part of the ecosystem, we see that a lot of implicit bias gets baked into the technology. And the same thing is happening in blockchain. So, but, however, this technology is new enough that I think we have a real opportunity to do better. And part of what I'm very eager to talk about today is to learn from Marnie and Maurice and others and talk about examples that we've seen, because there's so much work that's been done in this space, particularly in civic tech, uh, but also in the arts and social justice movements that I think technology can really learn from. And my hope is that we'll be able to make some more of those connections and bridge some of these learnings and help people understand that it can seem daunting to try to affect systemic change. It is daunting. It should be daunting. It's a really big thing. Uh, but we're not starting from scratch. We can build on the shoulders of giants that have come before us, uh, two of whom we're talking to today. Great. Marnie and Maurice, I'd love to hear from you if there's anything that you'd like to add. Um, as Sheila says, it, it you know, this is a larger part of technology um, and the, the development process and systems that we have. Where have you seen challenges in the tech community, in tech deployment and development around community building and representation? And what have the implications been? Um, and what can blockchain and emerging technologies learn from from the past or even the present as you know Maurice was saying that the initiatives that are going on today. Marnie, you want to kick us off? I'm happy to. <laughs> go you go for it. You go for it. All right. All right. Um I think from my perspective when thinking about like just how how technology is built and, and sort of where like so where where is that where that happens. Oftentimes when thinking about like how a company develops or even an idea or even how it's funded, oftentimes it's through communities, particularly communities that have access to capital, access to the folks who are making the decisions, folks who are just like, oh, I need someone to help me fund this thing that, you know, that I that I need to make happen. And oftentimes it's like the neighbor, the family friend, the the blah, blah, blah. And when thinking about what that does for access to opportunity and even access to capital, folks who have been marginalized and already kept out of these conversations, it continues to perpetuate that. And so I think what we see is like tech is just a, a, a microcosm of, of the systems that exist well beyond this particular industry. And I think that we the, the way the reason why the micro like the microphone and the microscope is on it in, in this way is because tech is supposed to be one of those things that could be a great equalizer but it doesn't live up to that potential and so when thinking about the ways in which we can reimagine and, and even using like blockchain and other immersive technology uh, emerging technologies it's really thinking about how do you how do you reimagine what that looks like how do you provide access and opportunity to folks early because if I'm in, if I'm in a community where I'm taught software engineering or even coding principles at nine and folks like myself who, who grew up in other areas that may not have access to that, I want to have no clue of like how to actually build any of the stuff. And then if I'm from a poor neighborhood and, you know, none of my family makes more than $30,000, you know, like there's no opportunity for me to be able to actively be a part of those conversations, to actively be a part of creating and designing and implementing the, both the strategy or the technology. So I think if we, if there's anything to learn from it is how do we provide access and opportunities to that earlier? And how do we ensure that when, when, when building and thinking about the ways in which we like fund, whatever the thing is that that's more equitable, that it's not just about your ability to call up your family friend or your dad's, you know, golfing buddy mm -hmm. to be able to sort of build and think about those things. Absolutely. Marnie, anything that you wanted to add from your experiences? 
Yeah, I, I think that's um, that, that's a super interesting series of points. At the organization I work at, uh, TechSoup, we're in the process of trying to imagine a new uh, technology marketplace, a place where people that have built things specifically for civil society and social good have an opportunity to make that available to do-gooders around the world. And we've been thinking about this question a lot, right? We, we're worried about the security, just give you an easy example. We're worried about the security of nonprofit systems. So if somebody's putting up a client management system or some piece of technology, we want proof that that's secure. But we recognize that that proof is saying essentially, if you haven't raised $100,000, don't, don't bother talking to us. Because we're going to ask you for so much documentation and a certain kind of credentialing that costs money, you know, so that we can ensure this safety. So if we really want to build a diverse and inclusive and equitable marketplace, how are we letting people in without creating the kind of barriers you were just talking about on the financing side? How are we not playing those out in what we're willing to display to, to other people? So, so we've been thinking a lot. I have a lot of stick figure drawings that are about exactly this issue. And then we've also been thinking, um, you know, similarly, who owns the data? So mm -hmm. when, when we put any of those tools together or anything together, so much of the wealth, the future wealth is in the data. Who can mine it? who can use it for decision making, which pockets of the data you see is a community contributing data, but not getting their own data back, or they see only theirs, they don't get to see it in this landscape of data that's out there. So, so, so what can we do to make the, the data belong to the, um, belong to communities? Um, what, whatever that means. In civil society, I think it means something a little bit different for for-profit, but civil society is just as guilty of keeping data under a lock chain because we yep. might use it for grants instead of, um, you know, stock market prices, but we still do it. Yeah. I think, you know, that, that raises two things. I mean, this whole conversation raises two things for me. One is, you know, who do we as a society empower to take risks? You know, being an mm -hmm. entrepreneur involves a certain level of risk, and there are systemic reasons mm -hmm. why there are reasons why you see a lot more white male founders from certain geographies and certain educational backgrounds, or or, or even if they were dropouts of certain institutions that reflects a certain level of privilege. There are there are reasons, and and part of them are um, are practical, are very practical. Who do we empower as a society to take risk? Is something that I think about a lot. You know, and how can we be better? There's a lot of movements in philanthropy, for example, you know, to fund more, uh, more diverse, to fund more diversely, just period, like just to kind of give a longer leeway to think about metrics, to think about what KPIs look like, to think about gen op grants or gen support grants versus kind of these very defined and specific milestones that are extraordinarily challenging to meet for those who are bootstrapping to some extent. Um, the other thing is this notion of data as a public good. So thinking about the global commons, and people generally understand climate, the oceans as, as, as commons, as public goods. But we have to really shift to a world, I think, where we are imagining at least certain kinds of data as a public good. Uh, and, and the notion that, you know, part of what we, we call this within the forum, we're launching this initiative called the Data for Common Purpose Initiative. And the idea there is that we should really examine data and interrogate it based on its use. And not so much that we assign restrictions on it at time zero, but assuming that we can provide adequate security, uh, encryption, you know, et cetera, anonymization, aggregation, these kinds of things, that you might treat data very differently depending on what its use is going to be. So, example, I might uh, mm -hmm. consider my genomic data, very sensitive personal private data, as a public good in the context of a COVID-19 vaccine, you know, for example, built by yeah. a public health department. But I might consider that very exact same data as proprietary and something I even want to see a return on. Like I want some ROI if it's used by a cosmetics company, you know, for color matching or whatever, which I would love to see for separate reasons. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> things like that, right? So it's the same data, but I have to kind of assess it in terms of my willingness to consider it from a public good perspective or as part of the commons, dependent upon what it's going to be deployed for. Um, and these are just some of the kinds of things I think that blockchain technology as an opportunity to think about in a really enhanced way because of the nature of the systems, how they are decentralized and distributed, how the power is inherently spread in new and different ways that are really kind of, I think, tremendously exciting.
Great. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to dig into here, and I want to be mindful of time. I think Sheila started to get into a little bit of how we can reorient our thinking around this. Um, so I know that this is a very pivotal moment. Obviously, Black Tech for Black Lives is a new movement. So I want to, I want to pitch to you, Maurice, and hear a little bit more about how that movement came to be and how you're thinking about sustaining commitment and action. How do we take advantage of this moment and where tech is, where emerging technologies are, and actually make sure that we're doing something different instead of, you know, keeping a lot of these same systems at play? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, so I'll start with sort of like the origin of it. Um, <laughs> interesting enough, um, a friend of mine, we were just chatting one day. He's like, hey, has anyone like sort of made a statement from like a black tech um, vantage point about what's happening? Um, I was like, nope, haven't seen anything. He's like, are you interested? I'm like, sure, why not? So this literally emerged out of like a conversation as friends who saw saw a need. Um, we recognized we were two black men um, and we we're like, okay, one, this is there, there's some voices that are missing from this conversation. So we reached out to a few folks to see who was interested. Some some people quickly said they were and disappeared. Others were committed. Um, and so what ended up being um, was a four four person team who spent a weekend sort of like imagining and sort of putting out there what um, we felt like our, our response and responsibility was. Um, that then grew to folks who have bigger voices in the space than us. Um, and we had some initial signers. So we before we went live, there were 150 people ranging from uh, VC uh, folks to entrepreneurs to, you know, just tech workers who were just wanting to be a part of something more than what, you know, what, what existed at that moment. Um, and so that's, that's the origin of it. Um, as we're thinking about like what this means and how this turns into something beyond words on a screen, you know, part of what I spend my time on and part of what DJ spends all of his time on at this point is thinking about the ways in which like folks who are once again on the ground, the folks who are in the communities, the folks who are actually doing like the work that I would argue is probably the more important part of this, the human side, the human work. Um, how do we give space and listen to those folks? Because at the end of the day, um, I'm disconnected in a way that that those folks aren't. I, I can have a bunch of theory about like how we affect change and how we do these things. But if we aren't designing our programs and designing our work with the most marginalized people in, in mind or like putting those voices at the center of it, then I think it lose, loses sight. And, and honestly, the, like the authenticity of it is, is, is not, it's not good. And so a lot of what we've done is for the four of us who sort of like were the organizer, the start of it, have very different skill sets. We're thinking like, how, how do we bring all these voices together and how do we ensure that the voices that we want outside of ours are, are heard? Um, and so that's where we came up with four points that we, we want to action on. So one is about internal tech. Like, what are the things we can do at our companies to push this work forward? Two, it's like, how do we hold people, particularly political folks, how do we hold them accountable for the communities that we all operate in? Like, how do we use our voice for that? The third is, how do we then support pipeline organizations, the folks that are actually on the ground, um, not, not the physical one, but the, the grounds that actually educate, upskill, and, and propel uh, Black and Latinx folks into being able to even walk into a tech job. And then the last piece of it is, Supporting community-based organizations, community-based movements that are calling for the restructuring, the defunding, and uh, reimagining of policing in our country because Black folks are at the center of the effects of, of fulfilling that. And so how do you bring all those, those four big chunks of things together to sort of like like make those things realize? Um, part of what we're, we're figuring out is what that looks like on a, on a broader scale. Um, and two, how do we empower folks to take individual or micro actions that, that build up into a, a, a stronger movement? Um, so more to come because we're still very early in the process, um, but we are being, we're, we're active, actively a part of 
broader conversation and broader movements that are that are actually moving some of these things forward. And then the other piece of what we're figuring out is a lot of the things that we've sort of highlighted and focused on over the last month or so has been Bay Area specific. How do we empower other folks who are outside of the Bay Area to also think about what this looks like? It can't come from us because we don't have the localized context. So who are the folks in these cities that have that and can work with community leaders to sort of imagine what that looks like beyond the Bay Area? Great. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to build on there. I, I really like the the focus on different levels um, and how it's both an individual, you know, has someone done this? Why don't we fill that void and why, why don't we do something about this? But also systemic and looking all the way up to federal level processes and really making sure that this stuff is embedded on a day-to-day -day basis um, because that's, that's how a lot of the change happens. Um, so on that note, I want to talk, I want to pitch to you, Marnie, on how you think about process and how you, you know, maybe caravans approach of how you meaningfully integrate these voices that Maurice was talking about throughout the design process and not just as box checking exercises along the way. Um, and how do we, how do we make sure they're, they're represented and heard um, and showing up in our design and deployment processes? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that question since you, you sent around the email to help prep for this panel. And I think the thing that I think we have found valuable and I hope the communities have is um, doing a lot of upfront research before we walk in. We don't think we're com community building. The communities are there. You know, we think we're trying to connect to people in ways that we think can be helpful. And so our first responsibility has to be making sure that we know enough to know who to talk to and what's already going on um, and, and that that help is welcome, which, which is a lot of upfront mm -hmm. conversation. It's, it's actually, we do a lot of desk research before we even mm -hmm. start a project. And we do a lot of informational interviews along those lines before we start a project. The other thing is um, that we try to do is in making sure that those folks that we've connected to um, own the problem that we're solving. I think what our team at TechSoup and at Caravan is good at is being able, we have a lot of uh, technological imagination and we're able to apply that technological imagination of problems in, in, in pragmatic and practical ways. And I'm proud of that. But it's got to be their problem. We can't come in and say, I read a news article. I now know what your problem is. And here's the solution. You, you know, and so I think that combination, the, the upfront research, the work to make sure a community owns a problem has been super key and sets the tone. The other thing that we do is um, report back to the community all the time. Um, and make sure we're right. So we also do participatory evaluation processes, which means the people that you're working with on the project set up the evaluation questions. And you're sort of always coming back to them and asking if it's right. It can sometimes feel like an exercise of futility because you're talking to two people, um, but it keeps you honest. And we've had some just remarkable things come, come out of that. Um, that, that we found out about much later, like companies that started because of some of the ideas or things that they were exposed to or projects that got built long after we'd left. So I, I always feel like those are big, big rewards, but it's, but it's hard to do. It's time consuming and it requires regular ongoing communication in a way that the community you're working with prefers. Absolutely. And I know we're almost to time, so I'll just throw it back to you, Sheila, to close this out and summarize some of these lessons for the blockchain community. I know this is a lot of the work that we're doing at, at the forum too. So just close us out on some of some of the tips and lessons learned out of this and, and other efforts. Sure, Samita, thanks. You know, I think this notion of accountability is really key. And it's it's again, it's it's that you're not a lot of human centered design, I think, focuses on the beginning. So at the beginning, you, know, you go in, you kind of, uh, you're, you're problem oriented, you're trying to understand what's going on. And then you kind of take this knowledge that you've gained and you run away and you go back into like the black box and you do some stuff and then you roll out of solution. That's a very common way of addressing these problems. 
And I think what Marnie's noted and what Maurice has indicated as well is this notion that it, it's never ending. You can't stop that engagement. It's, you don't kind of go in, you know, excavate Columbus something and then like bail out. You, know, you have to have this ongoing accountability. And so something that we've done, Samita, at the forum with the Presidio principles for blockchain is try to address this notion of an ongoing cycle of accountability and to say that the communities that you, that you engage with and the communities that are then created through the, the kind of remixing that you're doing and bringing various communities together, which is a lot of what happens in the blockchain ecosystem is bringing together various communities, creating new consortia or new communities that didn't previously exist. And technology can help do that, which is very exciting. But you don't have these accountability measures in play and you're not holding yourself accountable to checking in again and again on an ongoing basis, then you're really missing the plot. And you kind of, even though you begin with the best of intentions, you wind up in the same place, you know, a place that's not necessarily that much better, um, particularly as we know with things like scope creep and things that get missed. So as an example of the digital currency space, uh, you know, I, I've been, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that have just said, well, you know, we know that we can't serve, you know, 20% of the population. We just can't meet their needs. So we're just, we're not building for them. We're only building for the 80%. And I said, well, I understand that, you know, that's, that's what you're doing now. But what is your plan? What is your plan for integration? What is your plan down the line? What, what are you doing to kind of ensure those communities' voices are being heard and are included in the process, even if you understand that because of external factors, whatever it might be, you can't accommodate them right now at this time. And this often just blank stares. So it's really about quite challenging ourselves to think more about inclusion to constantly ask ourselves, who is not in the room? Whose voice am I not hearing? Who would find what I'm building harmful? And addressing, not just sweeping those concerns under the rug, but actually addressing them in an ongoing way. So it's really an honor to be here with Marnie and Maurice, people who are thinking about this notion, both in process uh, and in output uh, every day. Great. And I regret for myself and for the audience um, that this is the this is the end of time, but this has been such a great conversation. I've dropped a few of the resources that were mentioned on this talk in the chat. So we hope you'll explore further Caravan and Black Tech for Black Lives and the Presidio Principles. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Maurice, Marnie, and Sheila. Um, we, we learned a lot and thank you. Thank, thank you. you.